Hello everybody, I hope you can see and hear me okay, it looks like it, let's just bring that volume down a touch, perfect, there we go, Dr Chips here, I hope you are all well and excited about the day ahead because it is the great science share today, I've got the banner up, I've been looking forward to this day over the past don't know how many weeks I was doing the Daily Dose on a Wonder Wednesday and we were linking to the themes that were leading up to this day where over 86,000 people across the country and beyond are taking part in the Great Science Share, practicing uh, their scientific questioning skills, embracing that scientific curiosity um, and just doing a whole lot of learning and sharing. It is fantastic. Um, and I'm really excited to be part of it. I'm really excited to be uh, here this morning. And shortly, just in a minute, we're going to go to um, Farmer Tom, who over the last few weeks has been answering your great scientific questions about uh, the science involved in being a farmer. Um, but just before I do that, just a couple of key messages to remember about today. It is about sharing your uh, enjoyment and love and curiosity for science. And there's a couple of ways you can do that. If you're on Twitter or your parents are on Twitter, you can share your science by uh, going on Twitter and tweeting about it and linking, sending a link um, in that tweet to the Great Science Share Twitter handle, which is at Great Great Sci Share, um, or you can use the hashtag Great Sci Share as well. But uh, it's there's so much going on on Twitter and so much being shared already. If you want to as well, just so that we definitely get your science uh, to us, use the upload section on the Great Science Share uh, website. So um, the the Great Science Share website is greatscienceshare.org. You can go on to there, and in fact, at the end of this, I'll I'll do a quick demo to show you. But you can go on to there. And you can upload pictures and, uh, of the science that you have been doing. And please do that because we love to see the science that you are doing in your homes or perhaps in schools if you're back to schools. Um, uh, yeah, with you. We, we love seeing what you're doing. Um, but the whole point of this call today is... Um, to have a chat with Farmer Tom, because Farmer Tom, um, and I'm going to hopefully, if all the technology is working, fingers crossed, um, I'm going to pull him up on screen in just a second, but he has been responding to all of the wonderful scientific questions that you have been sending in about the science of farming and running a farm, and you have sent in loads. In fact, I've got them all here printed out so that I can be looking through them and seeing uh, the answers that, that Farmer Tom is responding to. So let's go and uh, see if we can say hello to Farmer Tom. So what I'm going to do, just give me a second, I'm going to go to this screen here and then I'm going to share my screen and hopefully we should all be able to see Farmer Tom, I'm sure that I will be contacted if we can't. Uh, hi, hi, Farmer Tom, how are you doing? Good morning, Dr. Chips. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm very well. Uh, it's a beautiful day here. Uh, it's uh, a yeah, lovely, lovely time to be alive and be outside. And, and it's not just Farmer Tom we've got online this morning. Who's that there with you? Hello. This is our farm dog. His name's Gatsby. Uh, he doesn't really do much apart from keep me company, but he's very good at that. Okay, yeah. Oh, yeah. and you having a bit of a yawn there this morning, a bit, a bit of a slow get up this morning. And so you're, you're on your farm there. Whereabouts just am I speaking to in the country? Whereabouts is your farm? So we farm near Peterborough in Cambridgeshire. We're about um, ninety miles north of London. About ninety miles north of London. Okay, so a couple of hundred miles away from me. I'm up in Manchester, so 150, 200 miles away. Okay, so and over the last few weeks. Uh, children that have been taking part in the Great Science Share, they've been sending you questions in, is that right? In their dozens. I've had some fantastic <laughs> questions about all elements of farming, from machinery to soils to climate change to sheep, to, you name it. It's been absolutely fantastic. And I've tried to answer as many as possible, and hopefully we'll answer a few more today. Yeah, OK, so we've got, I think, was it nine? Nine videos in total that you've put together from different parts of the farm 
um, responding to, to people's different questions. So, in fact, the first one's a really nice welcome to your sort of farm video um, where you cover a lot of the questions. We had questions such as, how many tractors do you have? How big is the woodland on your farm? From Oscar. Uh, how many sheep do you have on the farm? From Danny. Uh, from Tranmere Park. So maybe if we go to that first video, um, we can share that with everyone and then um, and then see if there's any other questions that they've, they've sent in that I can ask you on that kind of thing. Is that okay? Fantastic. That sounds great to me. Okay, cool. And I was really excited about this one because I love tractors. Um, in fact, when I was younger, and I think my mum's tuning in this morning, morning mum, when I was younger, uh, if she wanted to keep me awake when I was in the car, she used to shout tractor and I'd be like, where, where? Uh, so I do like tractors. Yeah, right. So I'm what, I'm, what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the folder here and we're going to go to your first video. So let's have a look at this. Here we go, everyone. Hopefully you should be able to see... Farmer Tom here. Here we go. Right, so let's go to our first video this morning. Welcome to my farm. It's great fun being a farmer, but it's also hard work. We have to understand lots of different science on the farm, from genetics to ecology and from nutrition to meteorology, the science of weather. On our farm, we have two tractors that do a lot of the work. But when it comes to looking after our soils, however, our flock of 300 sheep do the work, eating grass and weeds and depositing manure. That's what we call poo. As well as the sheep which produce meat and wool, we also grow crops like wheat to produce bread, barley to produce beer, rapeseed to produce cooking oil, and oats to produce breakfast cereal. As well as looking after our fields of crops and sheep, we get to look after the environment as well and all the wildlife around us. We have about 10 football pitches of woodland and 10 football pitches where we grow seed for our birds to eat during the winter and about 15 football pitches where we grow flowers for our pollinators which include butterflies and bees but also flies, beetles and moths. And these areas are spread across the farm so that our wildlife has a home alongside the fields used for producing our food. That's great. Let me just close that down. So what a fantastic um, opening video there tom thanks for putting that together for us and you answered a lot of the questions in there and straight away what i thought was really interesting i loved the, the sheep watching on by the way watching you do your filming um but uh, you were saying in there about all the different types of science that are used in farming so um was it meteorology the, the science of the weather yeah we spend a lot of time thinking about the weather and the weather has a massive impact on everything we do every day on the farm Okay, yeah, I can I can imagine. And then there was another one um, that I wasn't. What's what's ecology then? So you said that meteorology is the science of weather, uh, genetics and ecology. What 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 are those then? So genetics is all about the building blocks that make up uh, ev everything you see around you. It's the it's the code uh, that basically determines whether people will have blue eyes or brown eyes, whether the sheep will have black wool or white wool. And okay. so it's really important that we have an understanding of genetics when we're trying to breed better animals or, or, or crops as well. And ecology is just yeah. really this science of ecosystem. So ah. it's looking at everything that's around us, the, the wildlife and how everything interacts. And, and that interaction is really, really important as well. OK, OK. So it's good you mentioned that because one of the videos we're going to come to later about your insect areas and the predators and the mollusks and all that. And I just wanted to talk a little bit more about ecology because I think it's really important there. The other thing I, that struck me there that I thought was really interesting, because some of the questions were around um, how big your woodland is. And you were saying, I mean, it's pretty big then, 10, 10 football pitches or 15 football pitches? Um, or is it both? It was 10 football pitches of woodland. And right. that's not 10 actual football pitches. That's the equivalent of 10 football pitches. OK. Uh, and then 10 football pitches where we just grow uh, crops that we leave over the winter. And yep. the seeds that those crops produce help feed the birds through the hungry gap, which is February and March, when we actually, we get a lot of mortality. So a lot of the birds, wild birds can die off at that time. So we try to help them then. Okay. And then 15 football pitches of our yeah. pollen and nectar mix for our pollinators, our butterflies, bees, and other pollinators. There are not just butterflies and bees. Right. Okay. Okay. And in the world, in your world, do you, I'm sure I've heard, is it an acre, which is a unit of measurement that you use to describe? How does that, what's one acre? Is one acre one football pitch or is it smaller or bigger than that? Well, football pitches actually uh, do slightly vary in size, but they're normally about an acre and a half. Uh, an acre, as I understand, was the area of uh, land that, that one oxen could plough in a day. 
Oh, right. um, and so that's the traditional measure. But we now measure in hectares. And okay. a hectare is about 2.49 acres. Yeah. Uh, and a hectare is 100 metres by 100 metres. So it's, it's 10,000 square metres. OK. M much easier to understand, I think. Yeah. So a nice little uh, dip into some maths there and units of measurements and area. Super. OK. So um, now we had a lot of question about sheep. Uh, I was going to say sheeps then, but it's just sheep. Uh, um, so things like how, um, how important is it to have different types of grass for feeding animals like sheep? I think that is from Wolf Wonders on Twitter. Um, talking about sh uh, types of sheep called the Zorbals. Do you take them into the barns in the winter from Oscar? Poppy said, how many breeds of sheep do you have on the farm? So I think we should play your fantastic video um, about sheep. Uh, this is a favourite of mine because we have a um, guest appearance from one of your sheep in it um, who is desperately trying to escape a little bit as well. So uh, here we go. Let's watch the sheep video. Here we go. On our farm we mainly grow plants but we also have about 300 sheep that are kept for their wool and their meat. There are, lots of, oh, hello. there are lots of types of sheep in the UK, and you can tell them apart often by looking at their wool or their horns if they have them, as well as their size. Although all sheep generally have an ear tag, like an earring, with a unique number on them, uh, a good farmer will know many of their animals by sight, as we see them every day. You know you want to say hello, don't you? We see them every day, and we'll be able to tell if they're unwell. Farmers also have to understand animal biology and medicine, and know what keeps our livestock healthy. OK, you have a little... Can you say hello to everybody? We've got lots of different breeds of sheep on the farm, although this is a Zwarble, which is black, and they typically later in life have a white stripe on their noses. They produce lots of milk, and they make really good mothers to their lambs. Different breeds... No, isn't it exciting? I'll put you on the floor in a moment. We just want to show everybody you. Different breeds of sheep were bred over hundreds of years to fulfil different purposes. Oh. <laughs> By selective breeding, which is a traditional form of genetic science. Our sheep graze and that means they eat so they graze grass all year although sometimes when it's very cold in the winter time we give them some extra food do you want to okay do you want to pop down okay we'll let them let her run away if it's very hot cold in the winter we'll give them some extra food uh when they eat most of the grass in one field we'll move them onto the next field by opening the gates and just shooing them along the road it's really important to grow good grass because that is their only food and that's what keeps them healthy a good field is luscious and green and contains lots of different types of grass, so farmers need to understand botany, the science of plants as well. In the same way that we like different food, which has different nutrients, sheep like a variety of different grass to keep them healthy as well. They're out in the fields every day of the year, and they stay dry and warm by growing a lovely coat of wool. OK, super. Let's come back to you. Uh, there, Tom. So uh, another another great video there answering lots of scientific questions that have come through. Um, one I didn't say before we played the video, but you, you did mention is about telling sheep apart. So um, you, you were saying that uh, you spend a lot of time with the, the sheep and that good farmers can tell their sheep apart. Is that the case? Well, that's, yeah, that's definitely true. I mean, I'm always amazed at teachers who have uh, a class of 30 or so children all running around and how they can remember all their names and tell them apart. And, well, uh, we're the same. We spend a lot of time with, uh, with their livestock on the farm. Um, we actually, you know, we, we tend to them when they're ill. Uh, we, we move them onto fresh grass. So we um, check them every day. Um, so, yeah, you, yeah. you come to, you come to recognise them, the differences. Um, the ones that are a bit bolder and the ones that are a bit shyer. Well, I was um, yeah, I was going to ask that. In terms of how you recognise them, do you see a difference in personality as well as well as appearance? That's right. They're, I mean, they're, in our flock of three hundred sheep, we've got um, uh, they, they all look very very different indeed. But they're also different personalities. So some of them are bolder. Um, some of them are more likely to just run away. Uh, and uh, and then we've got all sheep with different needs. I've got a lovely old lady. Uh, well, lovely old sheep, and she uh, she's nearly blind, so right. we have to look very carefully after her. Okay, um, but uh, we yeah we try to speak to the needs of, of all our of all our livestock. Yeah, and um, in fact, you, one of the questions from Flo uh, was how old and what breed is your oldest sheep? So is that your oldest sheep that you were talking about there? Well, our, no, I think our oldest sheep back here is probably 
Um, probably, although some of them may be, may be a little bit older. We bought some of them recently uh, at the livestock market, so it's difficult to tell exactly how old they are. But right. I'll, I'll just see. I'll get my magic bucket. You might remember my magic bucket. I'll get the magic bucket. Here comes the magic bucket. Be... The magic bucket also works on me, I think, as well. <laughs> come on, come and say hello. Do you want to come up here? Look at well that. Okay. Oh, fantastic. So this, is, this is Poppy. Um, so she's three years old. She was actually a triplet, so she was one of three. Yeah. Uh, and she's very hungry. Um, <laughs> but actually, uh, her mother didn't have very much milk. So we, we took her on and we bottle fed her. Yeah. Um, from, uh, from when she was very young. And she's been uh, a pet of ours or a friend of ours for, for quite some time now. She, she enjoys the magic bucket. Uh, I was hoping she was, you might see her face. Oh, there we are. Hello. Say hello to everybody. Uh, but yeah, so she's this warble we were talking about, but we do have lots of different types of kids. You see how, look how thick that wool is. Yeah. Oh, it's um, amazing. She'll, she'll, the wool will come off in the next few weeks. We will shear that off um, uh, and uh, keep her a bit cooler in the summer. Well, well, it's funny you should mention shearing them because actually that leads us on perfectly to the next video, Farmer Tom, um, because we did have some questions about uh Cheery about sheep and their wool and about cheering them. So let's go to the next video now. Um, where we have here, let's go a little bit slow loading. There we go, right. It's just taking a moment to load. Here we go, right. This is Pickle, one of our Zwarbles, and every springtime we cut off or shear the wool using some clippers, much like when you get your hair cut. They'll be really happy because the wool would make them too hot in the summer, and they grow another coat of wool in time for the cold of wintertime. The wool, as you can see then, is then taken away and can be made into yarn for knitting into clothes, or can be made into lots of things, including insulation to keep your house warm. Each sheep always produces the same colour wool, but different breeds have different colours. And the most valuable wool is white wool, as that can be more easily dyed into other colours. This is Pickle, one of our warbles, and I think she'll be happy to have her coat off in a few weeks' time, because as you can see, the coat is incredibly thick for keeping her warm. But she'll be glad to be rid of it in the summer. OK, so that was Pickle that we've just met there. Um, who, uh, and you're saying that you, you, they, they, are, they have their wool cut off, sheared off, um, fairly soon then is that right that's right so all the rest of our sheep have had their had, have been sheared yep uh so they're all up in the the field with no clothes on uh okay. and very happy because it's so hot yeah um these th there are three sheep in this field who were all pregnant they were all in lamb right and what we didn't want to do when they were just about to have their lambs was to shear them because that you know they go from being a bit too hot to being a bit too cold yeah so um we try we try to just keep them as uh, as calm as possible so um we'll we'll shear them uh in here in a in a in a week or so's time but well, now they've had their lambs and got used to uh life on the farm okay and my question actually on that was um uh, would there be any chance in doing some shearing of my lockdown hair at the moment <laughs> have you been tempted to give it a go <laughs> yeah. i can i can see your lockdown hair and i can raise you <laughs> yeah. uh, quite a, quite a lot more maybe in a week's time when poppy and pickle and the other lamb have their their uh, fleeces sheared or maybe i'll go for the same you'll go for fleece shearing as well it, and it was we only do one style of haircut here though unfortunately right back is it right the back in short yeah the crew cut and it was interesting what you were saying about the uses of the wool because uh, pupils that are watching, a lot of them would have learnt about insulators and conductors and whether that's to do with flow of electricity thermal or the flow of heat. And you were saying in the video that the wool makes a great um, insulator for houses. Is that the case? Yeah, I mean, it has lots of uses and, and wool is incredibly diverse. So, so yes, it can be used for insulation in houses, but of course it insulates these sheep all winter. So it's, a, it's got lots of insulating properties. And also the other thing it does, it keeps them dry. It's got lanolin in it, which okay. is uh, like a, it's almost like a natural wax, which sheds water. Um, so it's got some fantastic properties. And of course, uh, it biodegrades. And we've yeah. heard a lot about um, man-made textile, um, mm -hmm. especially in the washing machine. Uh, the little microplastics go into the ocean and cause trouble. But of yeah. course, the great thing about wool is it's a, it's a natural product and it biodegrades. So uh, as well as being uh, warm, uh, it's, uh, it's good for the environment as well. So, Super. Uh, yeah, 
Win-win. Um, win-win. So, well, win-win. And uh, right, so we, we did see a couple of lambs in the background there but, uh, with you a second ago because we're going to go to another video now specifically on lambs. Um, so let me pull this video up because we had some great questions from people like Brooke, who said, how long is a sheep pregnant for? Owen, from what age can you have lambs? Uh, Darcy, are <laughs> sheep separate? Oh, that was a great, great uh, bit of heckling there from the, uh, from the lambs. Hello. <laughs> They're shouting something and running off. I don't know. I don't speak lamb. Um, so, so let's pull this, this video up. Uh, here we go. Right, let's let's learn a little bit more about lambs as you respond to some of those questions. I don't know why my video is taking so long to load. Here we go. There's some great questions. So also in the springtime, as well as being the time of year when we shear our adult sheep to take their wool off and keep them cool in the summer, that's the time of year that the, the sheep also have their lambs. And sheep can have lambs from as young as one year old, but mostly they don't have lambs until they're, until they're two or three years old. Most sheep have two lambs each year, and it takes five months, minus five days, from when the female sheep are with the tups, that's what we call the male sheep, until they have their lambs. Oh, hello. You're getting a bit lively now. Do you want to say hello? When the sheep are going to have a lamb, they'll usually walk off into a quiet corner of the field, away from the rest of the flock, and they scratch the ground and they walk around huffing and puffing a little bit. Uh, and that, that's just them getting ready to, to give birth. And mostly, most of the lambs are born very easily, and within 15 minutes, they'll be up, standing up, walking around, and feeding themselves, which is quite amazing. As humans, we take a long time before we're standing and walking and feeding ourselves. But this lamb uh, over here, who's only, she's only 10 days old anyway, was up within 15 minutes and feeding herself. Within six months, they'll be nearly fully grown and they'll have a thick, woolly, warm fleece of their own to keep them warm during the winter time. Amazing. Hello, you back, yes. Um, so it, it is amazing that how quickly they develop. You said uh, up and walking within 15 minutes, yelling within, how long does it take before they yell like that? <laughs> Yeah, well, very quickly. I've got one here. Oh, right. Yeah. There we go. There we go. <laughs> now, uh, she, she is about two weeks old. But as you can see, she's, I mean, she's, <laughs> she's certainly more lively than we are when we're two weeks yeah. old. I'm going to let her run back to her mum now. Okay, yeah. Oh, then off you go. Um, Bye. But, um, but they're, they're, they're amazing. And, uh, and Poppy back here had her lambs, uh, both lambs, within about 10 minutes of each other. And very quickly, they're up. And that's, that's their instinct. Yeah. So they're naturally, uh, they want to stand as quickly as possible because, of course, in the wild, they could be predated. They could have uh, whatever the kind of natural predators are looking for them. And uh, there's a tasty morsel in a, in a young lamb there that can't look after itself and yeah. move around. So they stand up very quickly uh, and they're, they're, they go to the, the back end of the sheep, which is where the udders are, yeah. where they get their milk from. So naturally, even, you know, as, as, they're, as soon as they open their eyes, they're struggling to get up and to, um, and to, um, uh, and to go and find some milk. And I've got, a, I've got a video, which I perhaps will share after this, of, of probably this one of those two lambs up there um, just standing for the first time and then straight away looking for, for milk. Oh, that would be fantastic. If you could share that afterwards uh, from Tom, that would be brilliant. Because uh, that would be amazing to see. How, just out of interest, how long do Zorbals live for? What's their sort of life expectancy? Gosh, well, many of them could live, I guess, seven, eight, ten years maybe even. Um, okay. they, as they get older, they um, sheep are, are herbivores. They eat grass, and that's the most important thing for them to do. They've got to be constantly eating grass and to eat a lot of it. Yeah. And when they get older, they have problems with their teeth. Uh, and, you know, we all get old, uh, yeah. and, uh, and, and teeth problems are, are inherent in the human population as well. But for sheep, that's even more important. So often uh, when they come to the end of their years, it's, it's often... Um, not being able to eat or, or having problems okay. with, their, with their teeth that, that, um, that cause them issues. Yeah, and pupils would have probably uh, had a look at um, the different types of teeth of different types of animals. They would have looked at things like carnivores having more canine sort of style teeth. With sheep, the teeth, uh, can you tell us a little bit about the, the kind of the types of teeth they've got and why they might have those? That's right. Well, the, the teeth in, in our lambs come through when they're about, um, it would be when they're about a year old. Um, and they have, I think, gosh, I'm slightly going beyond my area of expertise here. <laughs> uh, dental science would be something. Yeah. That we should but they have, um, uh, 
they obviously spend a long time masticating, so chewing yeah. their, the, the grass, because it's really important. The, the grass has a really thick cell wall. It's very difficult to break down, so they, they use mechanical digestion. They chew it as much as possible before it goes into one of their many stomachs to be digested. And, of course, the great thing that sheep and herbivores can do that we can't do is to digest the cellulose and the, the thick walls of that, um, yeah. of that grass and turn it, turn it into meat and milk. Yeah, well, I'm going to have to stop you there, uh, Farmer Tom. You said into one of their many stomachs. <laughs> what, what? So they have more than one? That's right, and uh, people watching at home might want to Google to see how many stomachs a sheep has. It's uh, definitely it's There's more than one. Right, wow. Okay, okay. I will be doing that after us as well. Um, so now you don't, on your farm, in the introduction, you said you, it's not just uh, animals that you focus your time and energy on, it's uh, growing plants as crops as well. Is that right? Yeah, actually, uh, a greater part of our farm is set aside for, for what we call arable production. So that's growing crops. Right. Um, and uh, so, yeah, that, that's, that's probably the, the main thing that I do as well as looking after the sheep. Super. So you do, you've got a video here where we actually see you up in the middle of one of your fields. So I think let's go and have a look at that now because we've had lots of questions that then relate to uh, that side of farming to do with soil um, and to do with climate change, etc. So let's, let's go and have a look at you in your, one of your uh, fields here and then we will come back and have a bit more of a chat um about the science in that side of farming so let's open this up here it seems to be taking a while to load let's try that again Okay, just bear with me a second, Farmer Tom. We're just having an issue. Don't know why, but it's not loading. Let's try double-clicking that. Ah, here we go. Yes. Well done for everyone out there crossing their fingers as I was clicking to load that then. It obviously worked. Uh, or did I speak too soon? No, here we go. Right. Okay. So let's uh, have a look at Farmer Tom in one of his fields. Beautiful evening it looks like there. Uh, here we go. I'm up here in the middle of one of our fields of barley and this crop was sown in the middle of March and today, just three months later, the ears, that's the part of the plant that ho holds the grain, are starting to emerge from the leaf. In two more months this will be ready to harvest and we'll come into the field with a combine harvester which will cut the crop. It'll separate the grain from the straw and then store the grain until the tank fills up and a tractor arrives with a trailer to take the grain back to the shed. And This barley will then go off the farm to be turned into beer. But as exciting as it is driving big machinery, we need to understand the science of what makes our plants grow. And that leads us down to one of my favourite subjects, the soil. OK, so I've got to be honest, I don't think I've ever heard anyone use the words favourite subject and soil in the same sentence before. But this is something that's really important then, um, is it, in terms of your farming? Well, that's right. There's a, there's a famous quote that says um, our entire human existence depends on six inches of topsoil and the fact that it rains. And uh, those two things uh, combined conspire uh, to produce uh, all the food that we eat. So soil is absolutely so, so important. Yeah, and I'd, so I'd, I didn't realise it was so important, but, but we've had lots of questions actually relating to the science of soil and things like B, who said, why is soil so important? Uh, Isaac, what are the best climate conditions for growing rapeseed? So talking about, you know, the growing in the soil of the rapeseed and the, and the climate for it. Why is so, so, uh, soil so important for growing crops? Amelia, um, and what keeps crops growing strong so i think we'll go straight back to your next video if that's okay from tom and we will talk a little bit about uh soil um and why it is so important so let's get this 
opening on here. Well, B, Isaac, Amelia, Wren and Jamie and others have asked some fantastic questions about soil. And I'm glad you asked those questions. Soil is so important because if we have a healthy soil, then we can grow healthy plants. In fact, a teaspoon of healthy soil contains between 100 million and a billion bacteria. In fact, that teaspoon of healthy soil contains more living organisms than there are people living on the planet. You see, as well as the bacteria, there are algae, microscopic insects, earthworms, beetles, ants, mites, fungi and more. And all these live together in the healthy soil soil ecosystem. And this healthy ecosystem helps to break down any dead plants, it stores nutrients for our plants to eat, and it takes in moisture during rainy times for plants to access when it's hot and dry in the summer. So yes, it is really important then. Um, so one of the questions I had at watching that uh, Farm Tom was that, so do you ever do any scientific tests on your soil to get an idea of whether it's in good condition or not? Yes, so we test uh, the entire farm every four years, and that means every hectare, so we said earlier a hectare is 10,000 square metres or about two football pitches, so every hectare has 16 tests, uh, and then they give us a result uh, showing all the different measurements of the soil. Now, there are lots of ways to measure soil. We can measure the size of the particles and whether it's made up of clay or silt or sand. We can measure um, the chemical components, so that's how much sulfur there might be, or magnesium, or and we can also measure the pH, so that's the acidity or alkalinity of the soil. And on our uh, uh, and in most crops, for example, need a pH of about 6.5 um, to, to to grow best. So that's very very slightly acidic. And the reason that works so well is because um, in the soil, different elements, so different um, yeah different elements. Are become available or are locked up depending on the pH. Right. So okay. we want them or as many to be as possible to be as available to the plant as we yeah. can. So six point five is the pH that of the, the the best soil. So this is all chemistry now, then mixture of chemistry and biology. Um, That's and, right. And, That's right. And pupils would have probably heard about this idea of acids. Um, when you're into key stage three, you learn about the pH scale and acid and alkaline, um, and it relates directly. Uh, to your ability to grow good pro crops. That's right. And if our soil becomes too acidic, which it can do, it will have done this winter because the, the land has been waterlogged. And after the land has been waterlogged, it tends to release um, hydrogen atoms, which, uh, which cause it to be more acidic. Right. Okay. Um, I've, only learned, I've only learned that this year, so it's been absolutely fascinating. But what we can do then is we can apply something onto the soil to make it slightly more alkaline to make the pH to be as close as possible. And what we apply is, uh, is, uh, is it's like a powder and it is mm. the byproduct of the sugar refining process. So in this country, we grow a lot of sugar beets. Uh, that goes off yep. to the refinery and sugar is produced. Uh, and then the byproduct, so the, the, the residue, is, uh, um, is a product that we put back onto the land to help okay. it be slightly more alkaline if we need to. So it's a lovely kind of cycle in using that byproduct rather than it just becoming a waste. That's right. There's no waste in nature. Yeah, 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 yeah. Million, billions of years of evolution has, has, has refined that cycle. Um, and I've got to repeat that fact that you said. So in a teaspoon, let me guess right, in a teaspoon of soil, there are, oh, go on, you, you say it because I might get it wrong. It's more, more, uh, more bacteria than on the planet or people there, on the planet? There are, there are more organisms than people on the planet. Wow. That's so. Uh, uh, organisms, of course, includes uh, bacteria and earthworms and nematodes and oh, all kinds of things that make up uh, healthy soil. Yeah, yeah. OK. I, and one thing I love about science is because it makes you just see things in different light when you start asking those really good scientific questions and being curious. You know, we see soil all the time, but to actually realise that there's that much going on in it, uh, it just kind of blows your mind. That's right. And we use all our senses. One of the things that I was always told about healthy soil is it smells like a healthy soil. So you'll very often see me get down and smell the soil, to see what it smells like. Right. There we go. I might go and have a sniff of my garden in a minute. Well, I've got nothing to compare it to. I'd have to do a proper scientific investigation. But no, that, that, that's brilliant. Now, we have had quite a few questions, really kind of 
topical ones this with current situation uh, with COVID-19 and also over a slightly longer period but something that's been uh, rightly so in the news a lot over the last few years climate change so we had questions from Flora about has coronavirus affected your farm um, we've had uh, year six um, at Middleton College Prep talking about the impact of climate change as has Poppy um, and Danny how do you stop how do you help to stop climate change on your farm? So you've got a really great video here that we're going to go to next, answering some of those questions. Uh, so let's pull this video up. Here we go. Oh, it's being a little bit slow again. Here we go, okay. Some great questions, and actually one of the biggest impacts on our farm is the weather. And climate change has meant that our weather has become more extreme and unpredictable. Last winter you'll remember that we had lots and lots of rain with the wettest February that anyone can remember. And then we had the sunniest spring and the driest May on record. Now this makes a big impact on the farm as you'd imagine. And some crops have died off, especially where the soils are less healthy. And whilst we've all had to make changes recently with the coronavirus, farmers who are key workers have carried on working. And in fact, the weather has probably had more of an effect on our job than the coronavirus itself. So how can we help to stop climate change on the farm? Well, as well as being a host to a fantastic ecosystem, a healthy crop and a healthy soil can take carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and release oxygen while storing the carbon as organic matter in the soil. Now, did you know that if we could just increase the soil carbon in all the farmland across the world by just 0.5%, we could take as much carbon from the atmosphere and lock it into the soil as has been released since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution 200 years ago. So there are lots of things that we can do to combat climate change. And another example is growing a range of different crops and even integrating livestock into our cropping. So when we take the crop off this field, we then graze all the weeds and the stubbles with our livestock. So one of the other things that we can do to help climate change and to help our wildlife is to plant wildlife areas that can provide a home and a food source for our wildlife, as well as some protection and a route for them to move about the countryside. And here is a great example. This strip of flowering plants, including clovers and daisies and fescues and trefoils and San Juan and uh, numerous other plants, not only provides pollen and nectar for our pollinators and fixes carbon and nitrogen in the soil from the atmosphere, but also links parts of the farm. There's a pond over there in the distance uh, and the animals and the bugs and bees can move from that part straight the way down to the woodland behind us. So we plant strips right the way across the middle of our fields to provide a beetle bank, a bug superhighway, uh, an access path for our wildlife. Fantastic. Um, let's just close that down and come back to you. Uh, Tom. So climate change is a real issue for you then, Farmer Tom, in terms of these more extreme weathers. That has a, that has a real impact on your on your farm. Yes, that's right. As farmers, we, we often like to, to talk back about extreme winters in the past. And people might mention the summer of 76 or the, the, the floods of 57. Yeah, uh, that's 1957. <laughs> But, uh, but actually, in recent years, you know, we've had the beast from the east in 2018. You know, we've just had the, the sunniest spring uh, and the driest May on record. That's since records began, so over a couple of hundred years ago. Uh, and we've also had the, the wettest February in living memory. So it's the, it's, it's the extremity of these events that causes us problems. Uh, well, causes us all problems, but particularly yeah. none more so here than on the farm. Yeah. And, um, and, and what I found really interesting was actually... Uh, the, there's the impact of climate change, but but farms and generally areas of planting can help to reverse the effects, and that's because they'll actually take out of the atmosphere some of the gases causing that climate change effect, like carbon dioxide. Is that what you? That, is that have I got that right? Is that what you were saying? That's absolutely right. So the natural carbon cycle is is naturally leaky. So obviously carbon is released from, uh, from, from livestock and other, and other um, methods into the atmosphere. It then comes down via um, uh, photosynthesis into our plants and then through into our animals. It's cycled right. through, but it's a leaky system. So it leaks carbon into the soil. And over years and years and years, the carbon builds up in the soil. In fact, when you look at where the healthiest, the deepest, richest soils are with the most carbon in the world, 
They're actually beneath the, the savannas, the steppes, the, the big grasslands, and they've been built up by uh, enormous herds of, of, of megafauna, of herbivores, grazing, trampling, uh, and depositing that poo. Yeah. We like to talk about poo. They're really yeah. important. Uh, depositing carbon into the soil and helping the soil to build up. And we try to we try to replicate that here on the farm by observing nature uh, and and replicating that as much as possible. Fascinating stuff, uh, and always interesting talking about the role of poo in science. Um, and so, and then that's so. Then at the end there as well, you were talking about your pollinators, and you had that area um, uh, planted within your fields. And um, we're going to go to a few another video now because there's been some questions about uh, pollinators and the role of bees and insects. So, for example, we had Annie. Um, do any other types of animals live in the pollinator area other than the po other than pollinators? Um, we sorry that was Oscar. Why are insects so important, Annie? Um, how long can humans last without pollen in the world? That's an interesting one uh, from Owen. So let's go to the next video now to have a look at uh, and learn a little bit about the pollinators on your farm and why they are so important. And then I will share my fact as well about the bumblebee. Uh, let's go here. It's opening. And cross fingers, everyone. I didn't anticipate the given that we've managed to do a live broadcast with Farmer Tom in a field, I didn't anticipate my laptop having issues playing the videos. I don't know why this is happening, but let's give it a go. Let's try one more time. We're going to try one more time, Farmer Tom, but uh, if we can't get these last couple to play we will be able to host them for pupils to watch afterwards and i'm conscious that there's so much happening today on the great science share day we might have to wrap things up shortly uh anyway so let's just give it one more try because this is a fascinating one to learn a little bit uh more about pollinators yes here we go right Annie, Flora, Owen and others, they're great questions about insects and I would say that whilst insects have been in decline in the last 50 years, we're starting to see increases on our farm which results from making changes like planting these wildlife areas and changing the way we farm. For example, we haven't used any insecticide to kill insects in our crops for several years now. You see, insects are incredibly important. At about 70 out of the top 100 human food crops, which supply about 90% of the world's nutrition, are pollinated by bees and other insects. And so if we didn't have them, we'd quickly run out of food. This wildlife strip here not only helps our pollinators, but provides a home for many other creatures, including beetles. And I'm a big fan of beetles. Now, some of the bugs and insects that make their home here might want to eat our crops and can spread disease. But many of them will be predators, and they will eat the other insects and mollusks, mollusks are uh, slugs and snails, that might want to harm our crops. So those predators really are the farmer's friend, and they help to maintain the natural ecosystem and ensure that we don't have too many of any one insect pest, and that helps me to grow healthy crops too. So here's an insect fact for you. Regular worker bees live for four to five months, sometimes not even that long, and in that time they fly about 500 miles and produce just a teaspoon of honey. Okay, uh, poor worker bees. That sounds like an awful lot of work, doesn't it? That's how. That's actually why I was asking where exactly you were this, when we started the call because I worked out the distance. That's like them flying from here in Manchester down to you, back again and back again, and they only live for four to five months. It's uh, nature is amazing. I'm always amazed. Yeah, to to do half a teaspoon of uh, of honey. But you were saying there about uh, um, all of the different interactions with the animals the ecosystem that mini ecosystem within that area and that's what i wanted to refer to earlier when we were saying it's it's so beautifully balanced isn't it the equilibrium of of uh things some your, your predators insects eating your mollusks etc that you don't want to eat your uh crops is that right that's right and it, and and again you know we are as farmers we're scientists every day we're observing nature we're trying to, to replicate what we see 
Uh, and, and actually, as, as businessmen and women, we want to uh, we, we want to put as, as little input as possible in and make as much out again. So very often we find that nature will do uh, the job for us. Super. Yeah. Now, on on the job of being a farmer, we've got a few uh, general questions about sort of farmer life. Um, uh, Poppy said, how difficult is it working on a farm? Uh, Annie, why did you want to be a farmer? Uh, is your job hard in the winter was the one that came in. So I think we're going to go to your last video here, Farmer Tom, that you've done for us this morning um, about more generally um, the life of being a farmer. So let's go to this video here. And... hear a little bit about the general life of being a farmer uh, on your farm. Here we go. Is it working? Okay, I'm not sure we're going to be able to share your last video there, unfortunately, uh, Farmer Tom. Um, so maybe you could just share with us a, a couple of answers to a couple of those questions. Yeah. So how difficult uh, is it working on a farm? Uh, I'm, I'm very happy to. Uh, do you know, it's, it's really hard. And to sometimes in the middle of winter when it's bitterly cold, when I'm soaked to the skin uh, and we only get a few hours of daylight, it can feel pretty miserable. But I think pretty much I've got one of the best jobs in the world. I mean, I get to call this, this is not only my home, but it's my office as well. Every day is different. I'm working with nature to produce food, which is really important um, that we, uh, you know, that we produce as much healthy food to feed our, our population. That's you guys as possible. Um, and so, uh, so no, it's, it's, it's a real, real joy. And you know that when you go into the supermarket, if you see um, that something's made in the UK, and particularly if it's got the red tractor badge, then you know that it's been made uh, safely, traceably, uh, and that it's been, uh, we, we care for the environment as part of that. And I have a test every year. I've got a test coming up uh, with 250 questions uh, wow. that I have to demonstrate to show how well I'm, um, I'm consistently producing safe, affordable food and looking after the environment. Well, good luck for that. Thank you. <laughs> now, all these questions coming in from people this morning um, has got me thinking about my own, my own questions. And, and one question I had for you um, was... What do you think is the sort of the most important trait or characteristic in someone like yourself who wants to be a farmer, to be a good farmer? What do they need to be like, would you say? Uh, Dr. Chips, that is a great question. Did you know, somebody asked me this the other day, so I've actually had a think about it. OK. Uh, and I think the most important quality is curiosity, because sometimes on the farm things go really well. Sometimes they don't go so well. Yeah. And it's really important to, to be curious. Why did that go well? Why did that not go quite so well? What if I just change this one variable? What if I uh, do this at a slightly different time of year or I bring in different genetics? What if I use a different uh, breed or uh, a different variety of crop? Uh, what if I buy a slightly different machinery, bit of machinery? Mm -hmm. You know, what if I read on this new topic? Uh, and so curiosity really helps you to, to become a better and better farmer. Fantastic. And you just sound exactly like a scientist in everything you're saying there. You're asking great scientific questions, which you know you can go and test. And I suppose when you, when you were saying before that you learnt over the winter about how uh, the weather had changed the soil pH level, you didn't know that before. But rather than just not bothering to find out, you were curious scientifically questioning why that might have happened. And then you, you've learnt something new as a result. That's right. And I think that's what keeps us young and uh, full yeah. of passion is that, is that every day we're learning something new. And if, because we've answered loads, thank you so much. We've answered so many questions here this morning. But if, if pupils have still got questions or um, from what they've said, you've said this morning, they've got even more questions. Is there any way they can get those questions answered um, after today? Well, that's right. I feel like we've only answered just a handful of the, of the many, many yeah. questions that came in, which was fantastic and so encouraging. Um, 
what you can do, if you've got more questions, you can sign up to a project that we started here on this farm four years ago called Farmer Time. The website is farmertime.org.uk. And that is a project which pairs a farmer like me with a classroom like your classroom. Uh, and that um, will have a, a series of video calls, normally about every couple of weeks. And what will happen is that the teacher will say to the farmer, Farmer Tom, farmer whoever, uh, we are studying at the moment genetics, reproduction, poo, air, water, textiles, mathematics, whatever it might be. And the farmer will go somewhere appropriate on their farm. They'll show you what's going on in the life of the farm and they'll be able to talk about what you've been learning at school and to answer some of those questions. So it's a great way to answer those questions and have them linked right into the curriculum. So if you're a pupil, you could ask your teacher to, to sign up to Farmer Time. Uh, you can look on social media for the hashtag Farmer Time and see what hundreds of other farmers and classes are doing. Uh, or you can go to farmertime.org.uk for all the information. And we've just launched in Australia, in Finland, in Sweden. It's been running in Ireland for some time. And it's uh, there are farmers in every county in England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland as well. So it's a, it's a fantastic initiative. Uh, and uh, I would just say just get on board and just be curious. Definitely. Fantastic. I, I have a feeling you're going to get a lot of new signups. My school certainly will be. Uh, that's that's absolutely wonderful. So I'm just going to say thank you so much, Farmer Tom, for uh, all of the time and energy that you've put in responding to people's curiosity this morning and the questions that that has generated. I've thoroughly enjoyed uh, taking a tour of your farm there. I'm going to say cheerio. Is that pickle or is that... That's Poppy back here. Poppy, oh, I'm still practicing my sheep recognition. Um, th yeah, thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you for, for um, asking all those questions. And don't forget, farmertime.org.uk. It's free and it's fun and it's fascinating. Excellent. OK, Farmer Tom, I'm going to say cheerio. I'm going to close that window down there. Bye, wave. Wave to the sheep. There we go. And I'm going to come back to here just to finish off. There we go. What? How cool is that? Um, I, I can't remember the last time that I was on a farm. A few of my friends when I was younger, because I come from Somerset Hills Way, were farmers. And it uh, reminds me of how much I enjoy uh, seeing everything that's happening on a farm and certainly learning about all of the science there. So please uh, don't forget, if you want to uh, be paired up with your own farmer, um, like Farmer Tom, it's farmertime.org.uk. And I am just going to finish by saying, have a wonderful, great science share day. Please do, uh, all of you, sorry, that message is going out to all of you 86,755 people out there, which is absolutely incredible. And that number is just going up all the time throughout the day as well. Please do share um, your science that you're doing either on Twitter with the handle at great size share or hashtag great size share or I did say that I would show you how to do this on the great science share website if you go to get involved here uh, things are going a little bit slow for me my computer's just having to think a little bit um, and share your science and it will show you here is the upload section of the website so you can share the wonderful science that you are doing today oh look at that my video is finally loaded well that was helpful wasn't it um so let's come back to there and i will say cheerio have a great science share and stay curious bye for now